Welcome back to your pelvic health podcast. This is Susan Winograd, the founder of Pelvic Core Rehab, and I am thrilled to be your host today. We are in for an amazing conversation today, and there are a couple of things that I'm obsessed with. One is the breath and two is fascia. So today we're going to have a great conversation about all things fascia with my special guest, Rachel Williams. She is the founder of Midtown Physical Therapy. She is an expert level John Barnes myofascial release therapist. She treats the whole the body as a whole, which should always go without saying. She helps teach MFR classes and continues to use an MFR myofascial release paradigm with human touch physical therapy, which is something I definitely want to dive into. Rachel, welcome, welcome, welcome. Good morning, Susan. I'm so happy to be here to have this conversation with you. I'm so excited. We kind of met by chance, not so by chance. You were looking for a physical therapist in Florida for one of your clients, which tells me and our listeners what kind of practitioner you are, that you were doing some serious uh, research for your clients to make sure that they got the very best care. And we ended up just hitting it off and connecting. And I love that we have that commonality that we both are fascinated by fascia. So welcome, Michelle, Rachel. You can call me Michelle if you I want. Don't, I don't know why I, I've done that before with you. I've called you Michelle before. It must be like, you must have a Michelle face, but we'll call you what, Rachel because we want people to be able to find Michelle- you. Is Michelle Williams a celebrity of some sorts or no? I don't know. Oh, no, maybe. there's like so many. There's Serena, there's Venus. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, so a, there's a lot of Williams. <laughs> there's a lot of yeah. Williams. We'll just call you. We'll just call you Rachel. Rachel, can you tell our listeners a little bit about yourself and your background? Oh boy, there's, I'm trying to decide where to start because there's so many places. So, start from the beginning, uh, baby. We got plenty uh, of time. So I was born, I was supposed to be born on Halloween because my mom said I was a witch. But again, I was born on November 1st. Also, no, I'm not going to go that far back. <laughs> that's that's hilarious. I, I, yeah. I really hope that she kept telling you that you're the happy good witch. Well, you know what? That's actually something that I had to formulate throughout my upbringing and come to that conclusion myself. And it's interesting that you said that because obviously witch can have several connotations. It depends how we define it. And I know that the witch has always been inside of me. It's a really part. That's that's actually the word that I use for my intuition, my internal guide. It's my witch. And currently, um, like my personal insta name is Omniscient Witch. And for a long time, my witch was an evil, ugly witch. And then it was a beautiful witch. And I kept going back with all these different descriptors throughout so many times in my life. And and I finally realized and learned and reconciled that it's just a witch. And it gives me information. And I have to listen to it, but it's neither a good witch nor a bad witch. But again, it's an omniscient witch. It's a very, very knowing and powerful witch that when I listen to, I can receive very good information and make very good choices from. So that's really really amazing. Yeah, that's that is amazing. And I think it conveys that level of intuition that you have that you need in order to be a great MFR therapist. Uh, and we'll we'll dive into that. But it's so funny that witches have this Halloweenish idea because in my head, when I think of a witch, I always think of that happy show bewitched. And the first thing I think of is the nose wiggling and it just kind of makes me happy. So witches to me are, are, yeah, Tabitha, witches to me are like a happy thing. I feel like I always think of that happy witch wiggling her nose, but tell us a little bit more about yourself. We know that you're a witch. We know that you're, that part of you has a lot of intuition um, and it's sort of transformed over the years. Uh, Tell us a little bit more because this is fascinating so far. I'm not sure we're going to get to fascia, everybody. We might just hear about... (laughs) About the witch? (laughs) Yeah, about the witch. (laughs) Well, we'll just say everything's fascinating, not fascinating. Oh my goodness. (laughs) Rachel, I'm stealing that. I'm stealing that. Everything is fascinating. Okay. Can I steal it if I give you credit? 
if you give me credit, yeah, you okay. can do it as long as you put the Midtown PT logo behind everything. I'm kidding. <laughs> you got it. You got it. It's so funny because the black and white Midtown pelvic logo has like a good kind of almost like a witchy vibe to it. Like it conveys your energy, which is like amazing and strong, yet there is a feminine and intuitive part of it. Love it. I, I, it all makes sense. It's all coming together for me now. Thank you, Susan, so much. And actually, I really appreciate that you appreciate the detail of my logo. I am... I worked on that logo with my creator for so, so long, and it has so many little details of not only the practice and our vision for the practice, but also certainly it comes from my own personality because I founded the practice. But one thing which I think, you know, and everybody sees things, it's almost like a Rorschach, my logo. Yes. And one thing that some people don't see, which I, I actually just want to point out for you as a pelvic therapist, because also it's about the balance, right? And that's what, whether you look at it from fascia, from pelvic health, as a physical therapist, Therapist, we're looking to balance the system, right? Yeah. And we're looking at the, the love, the unity, the wholeness of balancing anybody's body and anybody's, I call it the mind-body machine, anyone's system. Yeah. And if you look, I actually took half of the logo is a male pelvis and the other half is a female pelvis. And I had to get them to be put together so they could work to be one pelvis and still look kind of okay. But if you really look at detail, not right now, it's actually a male and a female pelvis put together to form the logo just to really show the unity and the balance of it all. I, I think that's incredible. And I can certainly appreciate how much work went into that logo. Cause I know with my logo, I had this vision of a butterfly and a silhouette and uh, you know, my graphic artist thought I was like bananas. I'm like, no, this curve needs to be softer and that line is too harsh. So I appreciate it, but I do want to tell you that you did convey your message. I did not notice that it was male, female, just because I didn't look so hard at it. But my first thought when I looked at your logo was balance because it reminded me of the yin yang circle. So what the message that you tried to convey is right. Yes. I, and I, I felt it. I looked at it. I felt it. I felt the message that you were trying to convey, which I believe, no, you know, I don't know you that well, but I believe that also conveys your mission and your vision and your purpose for your practice. Mm, Susan, that makes me so happy. And then, you know what? Interesting. This is how detail oriented me and my COO graphics person can be. When we put the letters of the business, Midtown Physical Therapy, which sometimes we put on our picture and sometimes not, we balanced the logo on the T as if it was a platform of balance. And we balanced the logo right on the T of physical therapy just to eat. So there's so many, like wow. I could go into hours of all the little je ne sais quoi of right. the logo. But and it's just a logo. And so but it's for not, me, it's really painful. Yeah, it's not just a logo. I think it, it conveys your integrity about how important this is to you, Rachel. Really, truly. Because when you put so much effort into a logo, because you know that's the first thing that people are going to see that represents your practice, that shows mm -hmm. how important that perception is. And I give you so much credit and, and, and props for that. Tell us how oh, I love you, <laughs> I love you too, Rachel. That's why I feel like we just, we hit it off. I don't think it's only cause we're two New Yorkers. I think it's because we both oh, just really oh, liked each other. Yeah. yeah. Oh, hey, Queen. Oh, <laughs> my patient coordinator just came in. Okay. Tell her to say hi. Of Hello, you are on Pelvicore Podcast. This is my patient coordinator. Hi. Hi Queen. <laughs> uh -huh. Now you're going to be famous too. Uh -huh. Oh no, it's okay. It's okay. It's so funny because this is exactly why. So this is Shallon Rivers. She's my patient. Here, come down so everyone can see you. Here, come sit on my lap. Come here. Oh, or here, sit over here. No, oh, on the oh. chair, on the chair. You guys are like a comedy act. I feel like I'm going to charge people to watch this podcast because it's like, it's, it's humor in the making, like this beautiful dynamic between patient care coordinator and PT owner founder. You could, you can see the love you guys. And, and this is why she's the one that I let run everything in my office. I'm going to, I'm going to kick her out so we can have some privacy. Okay. But I want to challenge, tell Susan the story of our first interaction and how, oh, how I hired you. Tell us. <laughs> it's a, 
It's Tell a us. Story. Okay, so um, she had texted me, and I wasn't expecting it. Um, she goes, hey, you know, do you have, like, 15 minutes to um, have a phone interview, a quick one? I was like, oh, okay. She was like, but via Zoom. And I was like, wait, no, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. She goes, okay, no problem. Let's do it at 6 o'clock. And I was like, sure, no problem. And then I go, okay, great. But my autocorrect, it kind of, like, messed up. And it just started saying, okay, great, but. And I was like, oh, my God. <sighs> oh, <laughs> oh, my autocorrect has said much worse than that. Let me tell you. Like, she's not going to hire me. I just told her that she has a great butt. And so well, I that, no problem, nice ass. And then I knew she would be a great patient coordinator to work in our pelvic floor and uh, holistic physical therapy practice. You were, you picked the wrong person to, the right person to autocorrect that. Cause we're going to have a little conversation at the end of this podcast about cursing. So you could talk <laughs> to Rachel about butts and asses and you'll never offend her with that. You actually probably instantaneously got the job just by saying that. After that, I felt very positive that I got the job. That's amazing. (laughs) The rest of her life now. So anyway, all right, you know what? I love it. (laughs) I love it. Have a great day. Thanks for all the great work that you do for Midtown Physical Therapy. Rachel, so so tell us how you were introduced to myofascial release and John Barnes. Sure. Go ahead. I want to hear it from you. I mean, I have so many questions, so many things that I want to ask, but I would love to hear how you became so passionate about John Barnes MFR. For our listeners who don't know what MFR is, it means myofascial release. So we're just going to use the term MFR because it's a little easier to say and shorter, but we're we're referring to the term myofascial release when we say MFR. And it's specifically John F. Barnes, myofascially, who's the founder and developer of the technique. And it's a holistic, hands-on approach to healing. Um, And it's approaching things through fascia, which is a connective tissue system in our body that not only connects every bone, muscle, ligament, fiber, but what it does is it actually is the conduit for our energetic body as well. And so it's really a very inclusive and holistic practice. Now, the popular words are maybe trauma-based care, that kind of um, catchphrase people are using, but it really always has been and always will be a fully inclusive manual-based practice of working on the mind, body, machine, and releasing Oh, you're, you're it and allow, give patients and therapists the comfort to be in a safe place to allow it to release itself. That is... Um, anyway, so I... Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Nope, keep um, going. So, <laughs> you I to- think that your Wi-Fi is not so amazing. You keep freezing. Do you have great Wi-Fi? I think it's as good as we get. We've had some power outages in New York because okay. it's been like our system was down yesterday. So Okay, right gonna- now you're okay. So let's hope for the best. So tell okay. us how I have a million uh, questions. Uh, ah! <laughs> oh my gosh. For for those of you who don't know Rachel Williams yet, she's hilarious. I think you were meant to be like a stand-up comic. You're, I think you should, I actually have a new calling for you. The stand-up comic PT. I don't think that exists yet. Okay, there's- We do it on Insta, actually. We try to be funny on Insta because we have such serious work that we do. I know. And actually, you know, it's funny because I think that it's really important no matter who you're engaging with, you meet people for where they're at. So sometimes I can wear a very serious hat, but a lot of times I think that the lightness and like humor is always a wonderful way to connect with people in a neutral way. You got to laugh. Getting to know people and understanding what is humorous for them, because we want to make sure that we're definitely meeting people for where we're at and giving them a safe place to, to feel and be and heal. Thank you. Thank you for saying that, because I think that's important and that we can accommodate our our demeanor and our energy to meet people where they're at, because we do want them to be comfortable. But you are hilarious. And there are a lot of like nightclubs in Manhattan that you can do a side hustle at. So I'm just saying the opportunities are endless for you. I need another job. So if anybody's looking. The, uh, it's Williams Midtown Physical Therapy. I'm for sale. You know, <laughs> I'll fly, I'll fly in for your first gig. 
Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, I'll give you the front row seat, okay? Yeah. So, so I you don't, can look right up my skirt. <laughs> I don't know if I want that seat. You're going to pick on me. I feel like everybody that l- sits in the front row seat, you're going to like make me like strip into a bikini or something. And drink margaritas. We'll and, do that together. Well, if I drink margaritas, I may... I may strip into a bikini, so we'll see. But let's talk about that another time. Let's, uh, let's be professional now and talk yes, about Pasha. Yes. Okay? So, so tell anyway. me how you became passionate about John Barnes MFR specifically. For sure. So it was a complete accident. So again, we were talking about my witch. I've always, since I was a little, little girl, I've always been in touch with my intuitive side. And at that point, I didn't realize it was something... Um, not unique because I think everyone can be in touch with their uni- their intuitive side. But for me, I was very in touch in a lot of different ways where it was, um, you know, sometimes it was a little scary for me as a child to have some of those connections with the intuition, which was just different than the regular feet on the ground world that we live in. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I always had it as a child and I've always been creative and I've always been drawn to, you know, all the different worldly things. And but then I really also was brought up with a very traditional upbringing. So it was like, go to school, go to college, become a professional. You know, I ended up somehow, I say I tricked my way into Columbia University. I was the first person to even go to college in my family. Wow. And so I had, yeah, I had a very linear, traditional academic track. And certainly being in that linear, traditional academic track back then, it was a little different than I understand um, people are learning in school now. Now there's a little bit more about fascia and intuit, intuitive work and all of these, what they used to call, we took a class called alternative therapy, C-A-M, complementary alternative medicine, which now I understand is a little bit more um, in fashion. Like it's come around a little Yeah, I, I mean, we. I don't even think we had a class on pelvic health when I went to PT we school didn't. 28 years ago. It, it's just, I think that uh, PT schools have come a long way. I think they're integrating more of a biopsychosocial approach. I think they're including more of pelvic health, but I still think that there is more of a ways to go to sort of include that in a curriculum where it, it's not alternative, actually. It should be primary. Right. Right. Well, I think the thing with pelvic health specifically is it is an advanced skill set. And, you know, I still I've been doing this since I got my license in 2002. I've been doing this for a very long time. And I still feel like a novice in a lot of things. I'm constantly learning. I'm constantly exploring. And I remember my first few years being out. Actually, my first mentor, I was so insecure. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing. I can't help people like it was really challenging. And the one thing he told me that helped me to get through those first three years, few years of being a practitioner was just remember, Rachel, you know more than they know, and you're here to help them so you can. And so even though I was like, I don't know anything, whatever, okay, I know more than they know, I will yeah. help them. Out. And that's what got me through because the first few years of being a practitioner was very challenging. And I couldn't imagine having the, and I certainly personally wasn't ready for pelvic health or any of these advanced things at that point. So I kind of see why in, in just like your basic entry level academic environment, they don't focus on it. But I do think there should be, you know, I know that there's like some kind of courses and I do agree that it's great the introduction and to have of kind of a global education in, in the same way. Absolutely. And I, I I want to say that I've been told that so many times by my mentors that you know more than you think you know, and you know more than they know. And I think even after almost 30 years of treating, I still have those moments because I think sure. the more you learn, which we are always doing, the more you realize you need to learn and the, the, that there's so much out there. So we still have, uh, you know, and I know we both see pretty complex clients and And at times you're like, you know, you think to yourself, oh, I I just don't know enough yet. And then you just ground yourself and you say, I'm here to help. I I know more than they do. And it's, it's a learning process throughout. Back to John Barnes, MFR. This is like a cliffhanger with you here. Okay. One, it'll get there. I want to say one more thing about my first mentor, which I was so blessed. My first mentor was an Australian manual therapist, Luke Bongiorno, who just recently bought the Noi Group from David Butler. So I got to work and train with him for all these years. And he's still one of my very, very, very close friends. So I'm so blessed to have him as my first mentor and so honored. And like, I can't even, anyway, it's a, it was a BFD, big fucking deal. And he's still somebody who's been one of my first wonderful 
wonderful mentors. And I and one thing he did taught me, one of his things as being a therapist is he always played the nose flute whenever. So he was he was a serious manual therapist and he was always so, so funny. So I think maybe he helped me bring out that side of me as a practitioner as well. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. And don't you think that having a mentor, several mentors throughout your career is imperative. Uh, one of paramount. my paramount. So one of my mentors, Erica Mello, she, I remember we had a conversation and I said, you know, thank you so much for being a mentor. And she said, when you are in our field, you should always have a mentor and you should always be a mentor. And that should always be part of our mission and our purpose is to have a mentor so that we can always learn from experts in the field and always be a mentor so we could pay it forward. Absolutely. Because as a mentor, like I love teaching, whether you're just teaching your patients, I feel like I'm a mentor to my patients, whether you're teaching other practitioners, whether you're in a class setting or a group class setting, you're always teaching. And when you teach, you're always learning. And so it's a beautiful exchange that happens with reciprocity. And Absolutely. that's the most beautiful thing about it. Don't you feel like you learn the most incredible things from your clients? I always say I get the best information from my clients, the best resources, the best information. When you have that therapeutic alliance as a relationship, as a give and take, mm -hmm. there is a, a, a plethora of knowledge that you can learn from your clients. Absolutely. And you also learn, the, you can learn positive things from them. And also when you listen with awareness, not only with your hands, but with your ears, you can learn some of the misinformation that a lot of people and patients have. And then you can take that misinformation and educate them further because sometimes, you know, with, with Google and Insta and all the resources that we have so in our faces, there's a lot of misinformation out yeah. there. And it's no matter. And I mean, I have a highly educated, wonderful, wonderful community that I treat throughout, but there's always misinformation and it's communication and not recognizing all of these things and also just helping people expand a little bit more so that they could be the best that they need to be. Absolutely. You and, know? and, and it's so wait, back to John Barnes. <laughs> yes. And I just, I'm going to make one more comment about that. Sure. They could be brilliant and we have such educated clients also, but it is so hard to filter the information out there because today mm -hmm. we're so bombarded by so much information. So when you don't have that academic background, it, it's almost impossible to filter the information and know really what's accurate, what's not, what applies to you. It may be accurate information, but it might not be applicable to you. And I think that's an important job that we do is helping people filter that information to help individualize that information, tell them what's accurate and what's not. And very often flipping a story that they've already created in their head, right? And just changing the dialogue a little bit. So yes, back to John Barnes. I just wanted to add that. Yeah. Well, I was going to also just, that brought up one of my pet peeves on Instagram because the medical side of Instagram can be very helpful and very informative. Mm -hmm. But for me, you brought up the point individualized it's per person. And so the, and there are some very good healthcare providers that are giving tips pointers, facts on Insta. And that is something that I never do and never will do because somebody has to come into me. I have to, or my other wonderful therapist, they have to get evaluated. I have to listen to their story because there's no one thing that I can give, you know, oh, here's three things to solve your back pain or right. here's three of that. You know what? I think that that is actually um, a disservice to our profession, to the medical profession in general. And I, I actually strongly believe, so on Instagram, I do funny things. I'll give out some some facts or kind of open the conversation, but giving out advice and people following advice off the internet when they haven't been individually assessed and, and their whole entire holistically been looked at is malpractice in my opinion, right. actually. And, and that's something I have a real problem with. Right. I thank you for saying that. We call it shake and bake physical therapy, right? When mm -hmm. you have like this cookie cutter approach that mm -hmm. you sort of convey the message will apply to everybody and, and everybody's body's unique. Everybody's body's different. And every single exercise and plan of care has to be individualized. I always say there's no two people in our clinic that has the same program. So yes, I agree one, I agree 100%, Rachel. 
Are we back to John okay, Barnes? Because so I want to, I want to hear John. about that. <laughs> so back to John. And actually, I got introduced to John when I was working in the clinic with Luke, actually. And so I had had, um, again, I was a new therapist for a few years. And coming out of Columbia at that time, I remember the first few years, of cadaver, the first few days, rather, of the cadaver lab. What we did is we opened up the cadavers and we took all the junk out and threw it literally in the garbage cans on the floor so we could learn about the important things. We literally took all the fascia out and threw it in the garbage can. So that's how much inf- misinformation I received in my basic training. I remember right? that, too. Mm-hmm. Which I, I'm not sure if they do it anymore now, but I'd be curious to find out. I actually heard that they're doing a lot of, you know, in our day we did cadaver dissections and when someone is no longer, you know, they're no longer alive, that the the fascia is not, um, it's not constituted, it's not hydrated, it doesn't slide and glide the way we need it to, right? So um, I, I heard, glide. right, right. So I heard now a lot of the anatomy lab actually is virtual. They're doing it um, through video, which I kind of have mixed feelings about. I, I mean, there was that experience was invaluable in terms of real life experience, but I could see a blend of it where in a situation like that, you're getting real live fascia or, or looking at v- like videos of how uh, live fascia interacts in the body. And Dr. Jim Barteau, Dr. G, he's a surgeon in France, and he does a lot of his surgeries with microscopy and cameras going under the skin. It's called, like, some of his videos are called strolling under the skin, and he shows fascia living, moving as the structure that it is. It's not a solidified thing. It's this constantly moving, um, and it's called biotensegrity. It's the way that it holds up our entire system. It's our guy wires or our strings on our, our line from our tent and fascia definitely doesn't work when it's dead it needs yeah. to be alive I would yeah, so absolutely recommend that people look up those videos because it 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 is actually fascinating. It'll give you You're fascinating. Yeah, it <laughs> is absolutely fascinating, and you will have a whole new appreciation for fascia after you see a video like that. Because we're diverting again, Rachel, but I think this is important because you can't see fascia on imaging, right? You can't see fascial restrictions. So how many of your clients, and I'm saying this almost rhetorically, come to you and they say, I've had every test done in the book. They're all negative, mm-hmm. but I, I know something's going on. I feel a pull. I have a restriction somewhere. And it's almost like they begin to think it's in their head until we lay hands on them and we have learned how to communicate with the body with our fingers and our hands and, and we can feel it. So I think for people to see that is so validating because it gives them another sort of I don't want to use the word ammunition, but knowledge to advocate for themselves. Right. I call it, we have our own internal MRI and CT scan. When you know there's something wrong, but it's not on the test. First of all, those are our best patients because those are what becomes the complex patient and the pelvic health patient yeah. because they've been through all the medical testing and the diagnostics don't show it, yeah. but the patient still knows. And I think often we are the first person that listens to the patient and actually understands their story. And we listen with our ears, our hearts, and our hands. And that's how we're able to really hear their story and to be able to support, to help them to balance their mm-hmm. wellness because it's all about balancing the system. Yeah. And actually, I don't know if you knew this about me, but last year, it's actually one year ago this week, I was in my own very serious medical journey. I was going from doctor and I'm usually pretty well of a person. I was going to doctors in pain. And I mean, I actually thought I was a pelvic health patient. I was bleeding. I was having weird things, pain. I was in and out of urgent care, in and out of the GYN for like nine months, 10 months. And I kept saying, there's something wrong. They said, oh, take this antibiotic, do this, something wrong. I'd be better for a few weeks, blah, blah, blah. Last time I went to my doctor, the GYN, she said, there's nothing wrong with you. Come back in six months. My witch was like, Rachel, there's something wrong with you. So I went to my internist, which I, again, I see her once a year. I'm not a doctor person that much. And so two weeks later, I went to my internist and I told her my story. And I said, 
this, that, I've been in and out, they put me on this antibiotic, they've tried this test, I've had this ultrasound, there's something wrong with me. And she actually said, you know what, Rachel? Let's do a scan of your entire torso just to rule it out. And I said, yeah, let's rule it out so that every, the world knows and I know confirmation. I'm just crazy. Yeah. Right. And so two days later, I get a phone call from her. And I don't know, you know, in medical, there's this like it, there's this funny thing. Like if a patient doesn't have long to go, you say, don't buy green bananas. Right. And like it's a joke. Right. Yeah. It's a euphemism. Yeah. And so my doctor called me and I was expecting her to just say, Rachel, nothing wrong with you. You're crazy. And I said, oh, hi. Her name is Dr. Bain. She's saved my life. She, one of the people that helped save my life. One of the many, many angels that helped. And she's I said, oh, hi, Dr. Bain. I was in a store shopping. I just thought, you know, doctors call you to give you results. I said, are you calling me to buck to tell me? not to buy green bananas. She went dead silent oh my goodness. for like 10 seconds. And at that moment in my head, I went, oh, fuck. And I knew it was an oh, fuck moment. Dead silent. And then I sat there in silence with her. It was like a good five to 10 seconds. And she said, what does that mean? And I said, oh, you know, it's that old joke. If you're calling to tell a patient they don't have long to live. And she said, are you sitting down? Oh, my goodness. Said, Yes, she said, they found a tumor on your pancreas. Wow. And it was my journey for several months. It took me months and months. So last year, they I actually went, went through a full oncological workup. Originally, they thought I had a neuroendocrine tumor on my pancreas. I was two weeks away. I was in... Hopkins, Sloan Kettering, Westchester, all the doctors were moving in that direction. I was two weeks away from having a major procedure to get a big portion of my pancreas removed. It would have changed my whole life. And the doctors all got together and said, this isn't what we think it is. There's something else. I said, oh, fuck, because <laughs> this was not what you wanted to hear. Right. I finally reconciled, okay, I'm going to get this cut out. It's not a great prognosis, but what else am I going to do? I, I took me a while to accept it and move forward and accept the fact that like, okay, maybe I only have a few months to live. This is not a great diagnosis or a great thing, but it is what it is. Ain't what it ain't. It turns out I ended up having a very, very rare stomach cancer called a GIST sarcoma growing inside my stomach pushing on my pancreas. So on film, MRI and CT scan, all the scans, they couldn't even get it right. Wow. So it was a very interesting journey. And in the end, it ended up being such a positive diagnosis and a positive experience because it's just one of those kind of weird, rare, rare, rare cancers where I had to have my stomach resected. They did a beautiful surgery. I ended up having it laparoscopically. And just last week, I'm one year of NED, no evidence of disease. Oh. And I have a very favorable prognosis that it's ne not going to come back the rest of my life. Rachel, that is, thank you so much for sharing that because mm -hmm. it's a beautiful healing story, but it is also a beautiful story of persistence and listening to your inner witch because we know when something's going on with us and we have been trained in a way to listen to people when they say, or to, to healthcare providers, when they say, nothing's wrong, it's in your head, come back in six months. But when you know, when you're, I call it a check engine light, when a check engine light comes on in your gut that oh, something's so going soon. on, can you hear me? You're a little frozen. I'm going to keep talking until you come back. When a check engine light comes on in your body to let you know that something's going on, we need to listen to that. If your car's check engine light went on, you would take it to the mechanic. If your inner check engine light comes on and you know something's going on, then you need to honor that. We still don't know how you became passionate about John Barnes' MFR, and I would love for you to define fascia in that for us. So, you know, it was like a natural redirection. Get us back on track. Okay. So, I, okay. So, so fascia is really our connective tissue, our web of connective tissue, which I believe we talked about a little bit earlier in our body. And it's this this web that consists of, it's not muscle, it's not ligament, it's a very different system, and it interlaces and intertwines and touches every single nerve, muscle, fiber, all the way down to the cellular level in our body. Each cell of ours is imbibed in fascia, and it's this viscid, viscous 
fluid system that gives what is called biotensegrity. And biotensegrity is really our framework for movement. So muscles can't contract, ligaments can't support. Biotensegrity is actually how our entire machine is moved. And it's moved in a physical, kinetic, and energetic way um, and that is actually the purpose of fascia, what it does. And fascia is also the conduit, excuse me, for our energetic body. People call it all different things, our chi, our prana, our soul, our intuition. And it's the system that is actually what moves our body with the biotensegrity to make us the human beings that we are. Uh, that was very well said. And Thank I, you. you know, we were talking before about meeting people where we're at. And when we talk about energy, chi, prana, there are so many ways to explain that to people, to help them understand it from a place that they're coming from. But we are all energy. That's what keeps the world moving. Can you, I want to convey through an illustration, and I know you know this because every John Barnes practitioner knows the orange analogy with fascia. So I, I love that visual because it really helps people to understand how fascia surrounds everything. So can you like, yeah, tell us the, the orange story from, from the whole orange to like every individual. Sure. And actually one of the things verbally that I think is the best way, because it doesn't matter if you call it soul, prana, some people call it God. I actually just call it love. It's treating from a pure, deep place within your heart and soul called love. And I think that everyone can understand what that means too. It doesn't matter if you attach it to a, a diet or another framework of beliefs, because everybody, I think, understands what love is. Pure, authentic, deep, love is just verbally, I think what it real, where it really comes from. That, right? That's hopefully the most beautiful universal way to articulate it. Yeah, for sure. And so, but if we get back to the orange, the physicality of it, right? When you peel an orange, you can see there's all that white stuff everywhere that's kind of touching everything. It's sticky, it moves. That's what would be the fascia. And then when you look at the lining, the shell of the orange, it's also got a little bit of a thicker, some more things that it helps divide the orange into sections, but also helps connect and stick the orange together. And the further you go in, when you open the orange even deeper, if you open up the section, you'll notice there's little white stringy things. So the more you kind of dive in deeper to the center, the heart of the orange, you're gonna see that fascia, the white stuff, a little bit different, but it's still all fascia and it's in different constitutions and different arrangements to give the orange its stability and security and also give its flexibility and it opens and it moves beautiful. And that's exactly what biotensegrity and fascia does in human beings. Um, you know, also I love, I know for people with a sensitive stomach, but when you, a really great place to see fascia is when you are um, cutting a chicken or a chicken cutlet and you lift up the skin and there's that shiny, gooey, like shiny, it's almost yeah. like snotty sometimes yeah. and it's this moving. Sometimes it can be harder and tighter when it's restricted fascia, mm -hmm. it's tighter and harder. That's unhealthy fascia. When it's really gooey and like snotty and slimy, that's actually that's beautiful. healthy fascia. That's yeah. what we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. And what happens is when fascia gets traumatized, whether it's emotional, energetic, physical trauma, just oh, there, there's trauma and insult right there, micro traumas or macro traumas. It could be a little thing over a long period of time, like a repetitive stress thing, or it could be something big like a car accident or a major fall. When trauma gets, um, fascia rather, gets traumatized, it goes from this gooey, flowy, moving thing to harden and congeal. And what it does is it congeals and, and condenses around our nerves, muscles, ligaments, organs, and causes them extra pressure and allows them not to function properly. Right. And so what we do as myofascial release therapists and pelvic floor therapists, because we treat the fascia there, is we find those areas of fascial restriction where it's hard and not flowing, and we use our hands and our hearts to loosen them. And then it that then allows, because when the fascia is hard and condensed, it doesn't allow our energetic body to flow throughout our system because they have to communicate together to have balance as well. Absolutely. I 
think that I, I, I remember in one of my courses, I learned that they're doing a new study on something called ground substance, right? Mm-hmm. Which is that viscous material that is in everything that surrounds our fascia also that can become dehydrated with, with trauma, with injury. And the fascinating thing is that's where injury is. That's where pain is because the tissues can no longer slide and glide. But the good news is, is with therapeutic touch and with MFR, that ground substance can be reconstituted. So that's part of what helps us release fascia. Can you tell us what I, two questions, because we, I want to make sure that we get all the information and in that we, we want to, but I want to, if you could, and I have to talk about meeting John. <laughs> yes. Yes. So three things we're going to, we're going to put on the table. One is I want you to sort of give our clients a little bit of a visual of what an MFR treatment looks like. Cause it, it is extremely soft, gentle, light touch. So I'd love for you to go through that and how that light touch is so effective. And also how there's an amazing book called Anatomy Trains, where they've taken a human body, there's a picture of a human body, and they've dissected the fascial system, I guess the external framework, because fascia connects everything, from head Mm -hmm. to toe in a continuous form. So Mm -hmm. how do we find the root cause of a fascial injury? Because we know it's all connected, right? And I want to hear about John Barnes. For Absolutely. sure. So fascial trains give some good information, but again, it's giving this two-dimensional Correct. linear thing to a system that's not linear. So actually it's not fully accurate. Correct. And there is nothing fully accurate because again, you have to look at the moving human being, hear what's gone on and get your hands on them and feel. Every fascial restriction in every human is different. So although I give some credit to that book, um, it's Tom, um, I can't remember, Tom Myers, right? Yes, Tom Myers. Um, it's actually quite limited because you can't really put it in a book yes. and show it. Because everyone's different. It's, I we, do we, think so. it's a beautiful visual for people to understand just the continuity of fascia. So for the oh. layperson to see, oh my gosh, it goes from the top of your head to the bottom of your toes. But of course, uh, we are living, human, moving, sliding, gliding, like multi-directional. Yeah, and it the correct, and correct. It this and this, it contracts and it relaxes with our craniosacral rhythm. Correct. It's something that's constantly moving. And if there was a book that we can have Fascia doing this, it would be a beautiful book because yeah. it would be more accurate. Yeah. But unfortunately, on this flat surface, especially, I think of us as more than just three-dimensional. We have how unlimited dimensions of who we are because of our energetic bodies and everything else. So it's really something that that can't go into a book. It has to be something that's experienced. And it was also interesting that you said, explain fascia with the light touch. I want to let you know, next time I see you, I can't wait to treat you so you can experience a fascial treatment because there's a range and a depth of touch, therapeutic touch. It sometimes goes where I'm not even touching somebody. I have to be in their energetic body because they won't let me in. And sometimes it could be a, be a very, very deep and powerful touch. So there's a range of um, depth that I can use because what I, the one thing I need to do is always find the barrier of restriction, right? And if the person is so upregulated and is, is out of their energetic and physical body, sometimes I'll go to touch somebody and I'll be several inches or feet away and they don't let me in anymore. And I have to start working here. And then I allow their system to take me in. And I just keep holding at the barrier without force. And it takes me in and the fascia system actually releases and then unwinds itself. So it's sometimes it's light touch and sometimes it could be very deep physically. And sometimes it could be very deep energetically, emotionally, because again, our fascia system stores all of our trauma that we've incurred throughout our life. And those things could be released in a somatic way, in an emotional way. Memories could come up, pictures could come up. So we allow the patient to feel and experience whatever they're feeling throughout. And it could be very pleasant. There could be sounds, different um, visuals, colors, expressions, colors, smells. I sometimes, I'll, people will come to me and, you know, we take a thorough history and they'll say non-smoker, this and that, whatever. And throughout the session, I can see the smoke coming out and I can smell 
the smoke coming out and I'll be like after the session and I don't judge because it's the whatever toxins they had inside of them coming out I allow it to happen and later on I'll say hey did you forget were you ever a smoker when you were younger and then stopped and they'll say oh yeah I was or they'll say something like and it's not always smoking cigarettes they'll say something like oh, I was down at World Trade Center and had smoke inhalation for several years. So whatever the sometimes smoke and other different olfactory and different visual things could come out of people that are stored inside of them as well. Sometimes anesthesia comes out because of all of the chemicals that happen. So it's a whole range of uh, interesting things. That, that happen. is fascinating, say, yeah. Rachel. How about if I'm going to hold you to treating me when you come down to Florida and then we can talk about my experience on a different podcast. Cause that would be incredible. yeah, cause I've done, I've done a, a John Barnes myofascial course and hopefully I'll get to do another one, but there's truly nothing like it. And I, I practice John Barnes MFR, but certainly not to the degree that you do. And I would love to experience it I truly it would be my honor to um, work with you and get to know you at that level and to learn from you because I'm going to learn a lot about you that way and to also have you learn about yourself. And so I look forward to setting the date and we'll calendar it afterwards. But that being said, I want to talk about two things quickly. Yes. So what we do here, so I've been a protege of John, but I've studied with a lot of wonderful mentors. And what we do here, I've developed a technique called human touch physical therapy, which puts it all together in a beautiful package. And that's what every therapist here does. It's an individualized, personalized treatment care. And it involves myofascial release and hands-on opening up the system, giving us the flexibility and the biotensegrity to move our bodies. But we also really focus on targeted neuromuscular re-education and very personalized exercise programming. So we give people tools because once you open up the system and get the flexibility, you have to balance it through strength, stability, and re-education. And that's another paramount thing that we do differently here. I know you touched upon nobody gets their own on one exercise here everybody gets different exercises slightly each and every session yes. because it's always based on how their response is. We listen to them and we customize and individualize things through our human touch physical therapy. We also do intensive programs. So sometimes patients will come to us who are in a really, really bad state and they need a jump start to their wellness. And we see them for one or two weeks 15 hours a week. And it's just an intensive immersion program to get their systems on the way to balanced wellness. And it works beautifully with our clients. That That's amazing. I am definitely certainly familiar with those intensive immersion programs. And I think that they're a really wonderful way, just like you said, to jumpstart a program and really get that momentum going for their healing. And yeah. And their commitment. Tell us, before we do some takeaways, Rachel, tell us about your your interaction with John Barnes, because he's a legend. He's my legend. He's the person that made me who, I mean, I've had so many mentors and so many angels through my my own MFR. We call it the tribe, or I call it the web, because it's a web of all these beautiful therapists all over the country that we connect with and the support that they give to me and that I give to them, especially throughout my own medical journey and throughout my professional journey. And it's all because of John. So he's the one person that, that started this theory. Um, it's his own ancient wisdom. He developed all the programs through the learning from his own injury and from him, what he's spread and shared and given to not only so many therapists, but to so many patients is really, um, it's a gift that I'm going to hold back from crying about because yeah. it changed me as a human being. He changes me as a human being every single day. He's with me inside the house within my home. And he, it's not really he, he's not, it's not like he's a God or anything like that. It's really myofascial release. The technique that he's created and given us for ourselves and to help others yeah. is a real gift to the world. It's that yeah. it's a gift that he's given and really has changed the way I think everybody looks at fascia. I think he propelled research in fascia. He propelled awareness in fascia, the way we treat it, the way we look at it, the way we understand it. So that mm -hmm. is 
I'm a little blown away that you have a personal friendship, relationship, mentorship with him, but um, maybe with some good connections, you could energetically connect me with him. I could tap into his, I could tap into his inner wisdom, maybe by taking another course. Well, even what I will, when I work with you, so yes, I will feel that, but working because I should send the message of my officials to you. So you'll get deeper connected with him, but I'll tell you my funniest thing. And we won't today. We won't have time. I don't think for the story about how I got into my official release, which is a beautiful story. It was a joke actually how I got into it because I was so linearly thrown off course at that point in my career another time. But anyway, when we discuss my treatment, we'll, we'll hear that story. Sure. I'll tell you my favorite thing about John. And then my favorite thing about my name, because John calls me something. So my favorite thing, whenever I see John, because John, and he still teaches, he's really, he's gone through his own healing right now and is doing really well. He's back teaching courses well into his eighties and doing it with a smile. And he's an amazing demonstration of utilizing his own techniques to balance his own own wellness and share it with everybody. But my favorite thing about John, and he's this big bearded man and very strong and powerful, yet very connected. He's a real true master. And my favorite thing is, and you, if you look at him, everybody's seen him. He has a beard. He's a very strong man. He smelled his smell. That's my favorite thing about him. So every time I see him, I get really close and I say, John, I'm going to take this smell. And he, anybody that knows John, and if their olfactory connection is like mine, you know, that limbic system, that real yeah. connection, John has smelled the same. I've known him for probably 15, 20, 20 years or more now. And every time there's just a certain smell. And it's this mix of like baby powder. And it's, it's like... Not how you would think that his, he would smell. Well, he kind most- he kind of looks like a gentle giant, and I love that you brought that to the table because in my practice, I encourage clients to use smell as a healing tool during intimacy to help overcome pain. So I love that you brought in that olfactory connection. Rachel, we're going to have to do a part two. Tell us what you want to leave our listeners with the number one takeaway. I mean, the number one takeaway is get started because even though you feel you may not be able to get help, you're not sure how to get it. The best thing that you could do is seek a qualified healthcare provider like Susan or myself and get started today. And your commitment to getting started, we will enable you to then go beyond any goal that you can imagine to be able to move, laugh, dance and do the things that you didn't think you were able to do to minimize your pain and optimize your balanced wellness. I and love that's so that. important is that you can start any single day, but you have to be the one that's willing to start. And then we can be the ones to help support you to even supersede any goals that you might have for yourself. Absolutely agree. 100%. I know people are going to want to find more of you, Rachel. We're going to have all the links below, but just give us a brief synopsis. Where are you at? We know you're on Instagram. We'll have the link in the show notes. We know that you're the founder of Midtown Physical Therapy. We want people to find you there. Are you anywhere else on social media? So I'm on Facebook, Midtown Physical Therapy, Insta at Midtown Physical Therapy. I just started Threads, which is an interesting endeavor. Wow. Yes. So I recommend it. It's super fun wow. so far, and I'm going to do it as long as it's fun. Um, www.midtownpt.com. And I have physical practices located in New York City in the Riverdale area of the Bronx and on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And we also do concierge home visits locally. And so you can find us anywhere. We also do consult um, via telehealth, but we do really prefer if people could come in. But we have found through, you know, after the pandemic and everything, that what we can do virtually online is so much better than doing nothing alone. But we do really love people to actually either us come to them or them come to us because the best way to get our hearts and our hands to open you up is, is in real time. But virtually, we could do a pretty good job as well. Totally agree. We're going to have all of your contact information in the show notes. Rachel, thank you. We are going to have to do a part two because we didn't have the cursing conversation. So we'll, (laughs) we'll leave that as a cliffhanger and have that the next time. Yeah. Love you. Uh, You are the best. We are going to do that. We're going to do that shit another time. Um, Hell yeah. yeah. And we're going to do it with 
a margarita and in bikinis, right? Is yes. What we said? Yes. I prefer <laughs> gin and tonic. You could have a margarita. No anyway, you thank you, my friend. I, I don't really care. I don't discriminate. It's all good. Oh, awesome. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Your Pelvic Health Podcast, where we give you the real lowdown on all pelvic health matters. Please don't forget to like, follow, and give us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you the information that you want to hear. And if you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to share and tag us. And always remember that healing requires a whole body approach and that you need to be your own best advocate.